Hello learners, welcome to another session. We have understood already that there are different approaches to learning. There is this teacher centered approach, there is this learner centered approach and there is another process which is also known as learning centered approach. In this session, we are going to talk about the learner centered approach. Myself, Dr. Sonal Chhabra is going to delve into detail about the same that what is the learner centered approach. As the name suggests, the learner centered approach is focusing on the learner. Here the learner is the one who is the center of all the activities. The teacher is there. It's not that the teacher is not there. But the teacher is playing the role more of a facilitator rather than anything else. So it's a learner who is the center of all the activities in a learner centered approach classroom. In a learner centered approach learning which is taking place in the classroom. The focus is given on the developmental stages of the learner. The focus is moved towards the maturity of the learner. It's essential that the teachers understand the learning styles, the prior knowledge, the experiences, the interest, the social context and the culture of the learner. So the whole classroom or the whole learning is based on the learner. So all these factors which we which I have talked about, the experiences, the interest, the social context, the culture, all these aspects of the learner become important. They hold a special important place in the process, in the whole learning process in the classroom. But I am not trying to say in any ways that the teacher isn't important. The teacher is always an important part of the classroom. What is happening in a learner centered approach is that the teacher is, is assuming another role. She is not in the pivotal position wherein she is dictating everything. However, she is taking the role of a facilitator of the learning process. Because it is the learner which is being focused. So the teacher is becoming the facilitator of the learning process. <laughs> she is not just facilitating. She is also acting as an organizer of the learning situation. What I am trying to say is the teacher is not assuming a passive role here. She is assuming another role here. She is acting as a facilitator of the learning process. She is acting as an organizer of the learning situation. Now, how does she teacher plays that kind of role? The teacher can play that kind of role only if she has an understanding of the learner and the learning styles of this learner. Because if the teacher has a proper understanding of the learner and his or her learning styles, the teacher will be able to facilitate the learner in a better manner. So what is going to be the role of teacher in this whole process? The role of teacher is becoming more important though it's assuming another shape. What is she trying to do is she is to stimulate the curiosity. She is to stimulate an independent thinking among the learners, develop problem solving skills of the learners, promote planning and execution of the projects. She has to develop self learning inculcation of skills within the learner. The development of self learning which involves acquisition of knowledge through the observation of phenomena or probably other creative thinking activities. So coming back to this approach, let's understand though the learner is the focus here, it's the teacher who is playing the role of a facilitator. The role of teacher is no less than the role of the teacher in any other classroom. It is only assuming another shape. And maybe it is turning out to be a more responsible role, more student friendly role. For learner centered approach, it is very essential that the teacher becomes to understand the learner. Now how she can do that or what are the different aspects of the learner which the teacher should be familiar about or which the teacher should be understanding. There are 5-6 aspects of the learner which the teacher should understand or should lay her focus on. Only if she has an understanding of all these aspects, the teacher will be able to perform better in the classroom in terms of facilitating the learner. Now let us understand what are these different aspects of the learner which the teacher should understand. I am going to first list down those aspects and then we are going to talk about those aspects in detail. The number one aspect is health and physical development. Number two is mental abilities. Number three is motivation. Number 4 is home and cultural background and number 5 is personality. And at the end but not the least, the another factor of the learner is the learning styles. 
Now we are going to understand all these six factors in detail that why a teacher needs to know all these aspects and how much knowledge she needs to carry or how much understanding she needs to carry about these six aspects. The first aspect which I have listen, listed down earlier is the health and physical development of the learner. The teacher needs to have a familiarity about the health also and about the physical development of the learner also. Why health? Because it's going to be the basic factor which governs learning. If the student or the learner is having a proper health, he is or she is going to be in a different kind of position to understand the process which is happening in the classroom. Suppose if the child is not feeling well, suppose the child is not healthy, he or she is not going to be 100% involved in the classroom. Now the teacher may be feeling unhappy about the same that the learner is not responding or the learner is not getting involved but she doesn't know that the child is not feeling well. So if the teacher has a proper understanding of the health, she is going to facilitate the process. Along with health, the teacher needs to understand the physical development of the learner also. Now the physical development happens in stages. Probably in infancy, the learner would be behaving in a different manner. The preschool child would be behaving in terms of the physical capacities or in terms of the physical abilities which the child possesses. And similarly, if the child advances, the physical abilities also advance. Now, if the teacher, if I as a teacher, I am familiar with the different stages of physical development, I am going to be able to plan my activities in a better manner. There is going to be no use of planning an activity which the learner is not able to do because of his or her physical abilities. Once done with the health and physical development, let's move to the second factor. The second factor is talking about the mental abilities. Mental abilities. As the name suggests, it's going to be the ground or it's going to be the foundation for understanding the learner. It's going to be the ground for the learner himself or herself also because it's based on these mental abilities. The learner makes sense of the situation what is happening around. The learner makes sense of all the learning activities which are happening around. Now, there are different theories about the same. But in this session, we are going to talk about the Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. What Gardner suggested was that there are eight components of intelligence. Now, let us understand what these eight components are. The number one component is the linguistic abilities. Now, this is this aspect of mental abilities which enables the individuals to communicate and make sure of the world through the language. So, you are understanding, you are making sense of the communication and you are making sense of the world through the use of language. So, these, this is the linguistic ability of the mental ability aspect of the learner. Then the second ability which Gardner talked about was logical. Now, what does logical ability means for the learner? It's the logical abilities which allows the individuals to use abstract mathematical relations. So, if you are a good logical person, you are expected to perform better when it comes to the mathematics things. Now, if the teacher has an understanding that there are these eight forms of intelligence or eight aspects of mental abilities, the teacher will be able to plan her activities in a better manner. Now, we have done with the linguistic, we are done with the logical abilities. Moving further, the third one is the visual spatial abilities. What does this word visual spatial means? Here it makes that it is making it possible for the individuals to visualize, transform and use the spatial relations or the information which is available to the learners. Now, many of us have this ability that we are able to remember the rules on many of us do have this ability but we have this limited ability we forget the roots we forget back away back to different kind of locations so people who are better with this kind of skill they are able to use the spatial information better and they are better at these things now having different sets of abilities is not saying that one ability is better than any other all these eight abilities have their own important place and we all have these eight forms of intelligence or eight forms of abilities. The only difference would be we would be having some abilities better and some abilities in a lesser form. Let's move further. The fourth ability which Gardner talked about was bodily kinesthetic abilities. 
Now what does bodily kinesthetic do? It enables the individuals to use high levels of physical movement, control and expression. So these are the people who are going to turn to professions like athletes or people who are using more of their body, more of the physical movement, more of the control and more of the expression of the physical movements which is happening. Moving further, there was another form of ability which was suggested by Howard Gardner was the musical intelligence. Now what does musical intelligence indicate? As the name suggests, it allows the individuals to create, communicate and understanding the meanings which are made from the sound. So these are the people who are better in terms of making music. Probably these are the people who would turn to be musicians or singers. So these people have a better sense of sound. Now once you go through the learners, you would yourself realize that there are learners who are better equipped with certain kind of abilities, who are better at musical ability, there would be a listener or there would be a learner who is better at intrapersonal intelligence also. What does this intrapersonal intelligence mean? Intrapersonal intelligence helps the individuals to recognize and make distinctions about others' feelings, intentions and respond accordingly. So you need to have this kind of intelligence also wherein you are able to understand and recognize other people's feelings. At times, we are not able to understand what the other person is feeling. A person who has better intrapersonal intelligence will be able to recognize and make distinction about the other person's feelings. Now once you are able to recognize, you are able to respond in a better manner. Now if we talk in terms of the profession which uh, these people should choose, these would be professions like counselling or wherein they are involved with people to understand because they are able to understand the people better, so they are going to work with these people better. Moving to another aspect of the intelligence suggested by Howard Gardner, he talked about also interpersonal intelligence. Now what is, how is intrapersonal different from interpersonal? Intrapersonal was talking about how you are reacting to other people and interpersonal is enabling the individual's capacity for reflective understanding of others and one's own self. So you are not just understanding the other people, you are understanding your own self also better. Now initially Gardner suggested only seven forms of intelligence. But later on, he added another aspect of intelligence or another aspect to the mental abilities which was the naturalistic. As the name suggests, naturalistic people are those who love plants, who love animal or any form of nature and they are able to understand the natural world better. Now we have understood that Howard Gardner suggested these eight forms of intelligence. Again repeating the same fact that it is not that the learner, a particular individual learner would be having only one of these forms of intelligence. We all have these eight forms of intelligence with us. The only difference is that one person or one individual may be having a higher amount of uh, one particular intelligence, somebody may be having better naturalistic intelligence, somebody may be having a better intrapersonal intelligence and somebody may be having a better bodily kinesthetic intelligence. Now why it becomes essential for the teacher to understand these eight aspects of intelligence or the different mental abilities which are possessed by the learner? Because then she will be able to appreciate that why a particular learner is doing in a particular manner, in a particular subject or in a particular class. Because it is his own abilities which is uh, equipping the child or the learner with the better things. So if the teacher is able to understand these aspects or these forms of intelligence or these forms of mental abilities, he or she can plan her classroom, her curriculum, her assessment style according to the same. Now we have understood health and physical development, we are done with the mental abilities. Let's move to the third factor which the teacher should be aware of or which, the, which becomes an essential part of understanding the learner. The third aspect is the personality of the individual. The personality of the individual is something which stays with the learner in any form of classroom, in any form of activity, whether it's happening in the classroom setting or whether it's happening outside the classroom also. It's dictating how the teacher is, uh, how the learner is going to respond to whatever is happening outside him or what's happening inside him and what's happening in the environment in which the learner is placed. So if the teacher has a basic understanding of the personality of the learner, she'll be able to plan better. You all know there are students who 
just with the sight are able to understand what you are trying to say because they have that kind of personality but there are learners who need to be pushed for doing the things because they have a different set of personality. Now that's about personality. Moving further, which is another essential aspect of understanding the learner is the learning styles. As we discussed about the mental abilities, here also in learning styles also, different theorists have given different kinds of learning styles based on their own understanding. But in today's session, we are going to discuss David Call's experiential learning style. Now what he did was, he based, he suggested four different kinds of learning style and they were based on experiential learning. What he suggested was that there are four major types of learning styles depending on two approaches. Now, what are these two approaches? These two approaches are towards grasping experience, vis-a-vis -vis concrete experience and abstract conceptualization. Concrete experience is short termed as CE, abstract conceptualization is termed as AC. But besides this, there are two related approaches towards transforming the experiences also. Which were those? These were reflective observation termed as RO and active experimentation termed as AO. Now, based on these two premises, he suggested that there are four learning styles and he divided the learners into four learning styles type individuals. The number one was diverging. What was diverging? This was feeling and watching, CE oblique RO. Now, learners with a diverging style are somebody who are more sensitive. They are able to look at things from the different perspectives or different here means the divergent perspectives. That's why this approach or this style, people with this style are called diverging as the name suggested. They prefer to watch rather than do. They tend to gather information and use imagination to solve the problems. They are people who choose to work in groups or to listen with an open mind and to receive the personal feedback. So, if you understood what are the different characteristics of diverging learners, they are supposed to have an open mind, they are people who have different perspectives, they are people who like to work in teams and they also like to receive personal feedback. This was about diverging style of learners. Then the next one is the assimilating type. Assimilating are watching and thinking people, AC oblique RO. Learners with an assimilating learning style are less focused on people. Diverging, less, diverging learners were focused on people. Assimilating learning style people are less focused on people. They are more interested in ideas and abstract concepts. So the, here the focus is ideas, abstract concepts. They are more attached to logically sound theories than approaches based on practical value. So they are not focusing towards the practical aspects of the situation, they are focusing on the logic. That's why they get attracted more by the logically sound theories. They prefer to read, they prefer to lecture, they explore analytical models and they have the time to think the things through because they are those thinking type of people. The third set of learners is the converging people. Converging people are the people who are doing and thinking, AC oblique AE. They are the learners with a converging learning style. Diverging was people having different perspectives. Converging are the people who do not appreciate different perspectives. They are converging learning style. They can solve the people's problems and will use their learning to find a solution to the practical issues. They prefer technical tasks and are less concerned with the people. Again, unlike diverging people who were people who were focused on people and they were people who used to enjoy working in groups, these converging learners, they are less concerned with people and interpersonal aspects. They can solve problems, they can make decisions by finding solutions to questions and problems. Further, they like to experiment with the new ideas to stimulate and to work with the practical application. So, this is different from how the second set of learners or the assimilating set of learners were behaving. They were focusing on logic, they were not focusing on practical applications, but this set of learner of converging people, they are focusing on working with practical applications. So you would appreciate that all these learners have their own asset areas, have their own characteristics and they behave accordingly. 
Then the fourth set of learner comes across which is the accommodating style of learners. Now accommodating people are termed as people who are doing and feeling. This E oblique AE people. The accommodating learning style is hands on people. They rely on intuition rather than logic. These learners use other people's analysis and they prefer to take a practical experiential approach to solve any kind of problem. They are attracted to new challenges and experiences and to carrying out plans. They prefer to work in teams and to complete the task. They set the targets and actively work in the field trying different ways to achieve an objective. So we have an understanding that how these four categories of learning style people behave. But again emphasizing as we suggested in the Harvard Gardner's theory, it's not that the learner doesn't use any other kind of thing. There are learners who would be using different kind of things, but there is one learning style which predominates your personality or which predominates the learner's personality. So, they may be diverging, they may be assimilating, they may be converging and they may be accommodating. In terms of the style which is dominating your learning style, you may be using other approaches also depending on the situations and other things, but primarily or majorly you are using one particular style, that is why you are termed in that particular category. But for those four categories, they were converging, diverging, accommodating and assimilating. And all these four learning styles have their own importance because that adds to the variety or the diversity in the classroom. Now learning style as a premise is influenced by several factors. Let us just briefly discuss what are those factors. The number one would be the learning situation as suggested earlier also. Depending on the situation you may be using a particular learning style. Also it is based on the experiences the motivation and also we need to emphasize and appreciate that it should be regarded as a link between the personality and the cognitive behavior of the learner. So learning styles here becomes very important because it is the one which is establishing the link between the personality and the cognitive behavior of the learner. We have already discussed personality and we have discussed that how personality influences the learner and why a teacher should understand personality also when she is trying to understand the learner. Besides personality, we have also discussed learning styles and we know that it is a learning style which is establishing a link between the personality and the cognitive behavior of the learner. So we have done with four factors. The fifth factor which comes in discussion here is the motivation. What motivates the child? That is very important for the teacher to understand whether it is the external motivation which is influencing the child or whether it is the internal factors which are motivating the child, where the child's locus of control lies. The child may be more motivated by the external rewards the child is getting or the child may get more motivated by the internal motivation or by the internal factors. So the teacher needs to induce those factors only which is influencing the child's motivation. If, if as a teacher I know that my learner or my uh, student is going to get motivated more by my words, I am going to use that style of motivation. But if I know that the child would appreciate or the learner would appreciate if he or she is getting a chocolate for the same or if he or she is getting a recognition for the same, then I need to use that strategy of motivation. Now there are other factors also which determine the motivation, but basically the motivation is influenced either by the external factors or by the internal factor and if the teacher is appreciating those two factors, the teacher will be able to be in a better position to motivate the learner. Done with the five factors, let us move down to home and cultural background. Now this seems to be simple, at times people say it is not connected to the learning which is happening in the classroom, but the home and the cultural background of the learner is very very essential factor when it comes to understanding the learner. It is the culture of the school, it is the culture of the home, it is the culture of the peer and the social environment which as a whole influences how the children learn. You can see in the picture there is home, there is peer oblique school and there is then social environment which the child is exposed to. Now you can see that the learner is at the center and it is the home which is making the most influence. The loosened influence is of the next stages of the peer and the school and the 
least uh, influence would be of the social environment. But not in any ways trying to say that it's not influencing. All the three are playing their own role. The home is playing their own role, the peer group is playing, it's affecting the child and the social environment which the child is exposed to. The cultural influences on learning can be due to the cultural experiences, the mediation of the language and the learning dispositions. My, my favorite dialogue in the classroom is that when a student enters the classroom, it's not only the student who is entering the classroom. He or she with himself, he is bringing his home into the classroom. He is bringing his culture into the classroom. So, culture, even if it's an outside aspect, it's influencing the learning to a large extent. And if the teacher is having an understanding of the process, the teacher will be in a better position to understand the learner and to plan all her experiences accordingly. Now, how does culture uh, influences the learning? It can be due to the cultural experiences of the learner. There are different cultures, there are different cultural norms and the promotion of the learning happening in the different cultures. There may be cultures who are more uh, appreciative of the idea of school learning, but there may be cultures who are not that appreciative. So, that is going to influence how the learning is happening in the classroom. The second factor is the mediation of the language. How the language is being used in a particular language, classroom or in a particular culture. So, that is going to influence the learning of the learner. The third factor is the learning dispositions which the child is having. Even the culture is influencing the learning dispositions. Now, if you go through these three points, you understand that it is the learner and it is the culture which is making a huge impact on these things and these are the things which are directly influencing the learning process. These are not the things which are taking a back seat or which, these are not the things which are acting behind the curtain but learning dispositions is something which is going to directly influence the learning which is happening in the classroom. So, one can appreciate that besides culture, besides home, there is another factor, it is similar to home or it comes in the home is the family. The family is supposed to be the emotional capital of the classroom of the individual learner. So, if the child is having this emotional capital as a secure environment, the learner is going to behave in a different manner. If the child is coming from an unstable family or from a family wherein the child is, uh, whether in the parents are going in through a divorce, the child is going to experience a different kind of environment and the child is going to react in a different manner in the classroom. If the teacher is able to understand all these aspects of the learner, she is definitely going to be in a better position to help the learner in this process. Now, why it becomes essential for teacher to understand all these factors is, as we have discussed earlier also, because it is a learner centered approach. The focus is on the learner. So, the teacher needs to understand all these aspects. Moving further to the last leg of the session is the role of the teacher. The primest role of the teacher was understanding the learner. If she has done that job, she has done half her job. But let us understand how does she acts in the classroom. Her number one role would be as an observer and diagnostician of the learner. She is not just going to act as an observer, she is going to act as a diagnostician. Now, what does that word means? Here the role is to estimate and diagnose the strengths, weaknesses, learning needs and learning dispositions to shape and provide an appropriate learning environment and learning activities for the learners. The word diagnostician seems like uh, somebody like a doctor. Actually, she is like a doctor in the classroom because she is going to be the one who is going to examine and diagnose the strengths, weaknesses, what are the different learning needs of the learner, what are the different learning dispositions which the learner carries. And why is she doing all this? Because she wants to understand all these things and plan the environment in a better manner so that fruitful learning activities are planned for the learner. The second one, the teacher is supposed to be a provider of the environment for a learning. She is supposed to plan a learning environment that is conducive so that each learner would find enough scope and opportunity to fulfill his or her needs. Because uh, one should never forget that it is in a classroom, whatever approach you are using, it is not only single individual which is there in the classroom. There are different numbers of learners in the classroom. So, the teacher needs to understand this process and she needs to appreciate the learning needs of all the learners. So, that is a challenge in itself 
But if the teacher is sensitive enough, she'll be able to do that part very easily. Because you need to have that kind of uh, sensitivity for the learners. Only then you'll be able to appreciate their needs and only then you'll be able to provide opportunities to fulfill his or her needs. The third important role of the teacher is the facilitator of learning. She's not just a diagnostician, she's just not a provider, but she is a facilitator of the learning also. She has to look for occasions to help the learner while they are engaged in learning. Now the learners, we all know that they are not always in that process. They may be looking for times when they are out of that learning thing. They may be talking to each other or they may be doing some other business. So the teacher here, she has to look for the situations wherein she can engage the learner more and she can help the learner when they are engaged in learning also. So if the child is doing a project on his own, the teacher can help the student in that. Now having understood that why a teacher needs to understand the learner and also understood that what is the role of the teacher in the learner-centered approach, I hope you will be able to understand and appreciate that why this kind of approach should be adopted in classrooms. That's all for the session. Thank you.